Hi guys, Dr. Douglas Gillard here once again. Yesterday in cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology, I said that I cut out a bunch of slides because I don't have time to go over the physiology of the conduction system of the heart. I said I'd refer you to a YouTube video and I thought I made one, but I didn't. So <clears throat> this is going to serve that purpose. These are the slides that I cut out. And let me get my little pointer going here. All right. <clears throat> so uh, now this is not traditional uh, physiology, <clears throat> talking about flow of calcium and the sodium and potassium. This is to get you ready to understand how electrocardiogram, EKG, ECG, how that works. So this is good background material. All right. So let's get into it. So cardiac conduction system, here it is, basically, and we'll go over all this. I won't go over it now, but the stars of the show are the SA node, uh, the AV node right here in the bundle of Hiss, and the bundle branches, but we'll get into that. So heart beats over 3 billion times in your lifetime. That is a lot of, of muscle contraction going on without any type of rest at all. In order for it to beat properly, you have to have a normally function electrical system. That electrical system is called the cardiac conduction system. Another key thing to understand is the action potential. Okay, so the as as we should know from basic physiology, the SA node, cytoatrial node, usually depolarizes first and sends out a wave of depolarization. Now we can use that wave of depolarization. There's a bunch of AKAs for that. <clears throat> I could call it the impulse, the current, the signal, the signal, uh, signals, the electrical signals, the wave of depolarization. Okay, they all mean the same thing. Most of the time I'll just call it the current or the impulse. But when I say that, I'm talking about the SA node sparking a wave of depolarization that sweeps over the atria uh, goes through the fiber skeleton and then sweeps over the ventricles to cause a contraction of the heart and eject blood from the heart and keep our blood flowing and keep us alive. So the key is that action potential. It's kind of like a drop of water hitting a flat pond of water that is still with no ripples. And this would be the SA node and it sparks and all the cells around it have the ability to depolarize as well as have autorhythmacy, which we'll see. Uh, but it spreads, that wave of depolarization spreads out everywhere over the atria. And we'll look at that. The other key thing, because this is leading up to uh, talking about arrhythmias and EKG, all that stuff, um, this doesn't always happen in the SA node. This could happen in your left ventricle. Some of the ventricle cells could generate a a impulse and actually pace the heart for a couple beats or maybe your left uh, or your right atria or your right ventricle or your junctional region the same thing can occur usually occurs in the SA node because this guy depolarization depolarizes faster than anybody else as we'll see what's the job of the conduction system well it's to carry the wave of depolarization from Whoever, deep, whoever sparks the heart first, which is usually the SA node, and to carry it through the atria, through the junctional region, and that junctional region includes, that contains the fiber skeleton, through the bundle branches and into the ventricles. If everything is working fine, and one of the tricks of this conduction system, we have to have a slight delay. We can't let the signal jump right from the atria into the ventricles. There's got to be a delay, about a sixth of a second. That will give time, give the ventricles time to fill up completely with blood. And then we have a, a ventricular systole occurs and we get a nice ejection of blood and the blood flows through the heart. What is this junctional region? Some of you may not know what that is. Uh, so here is a cross-section, coronal, or not a cross-section, <coughs> coronal view of the heart with the right ventricle removed basically and you can see the right atrium back here and this is the junctional region right here so it's basically when the authors say junctional region they're really talking about the AV node 
the penetrating fibers of the bundle of his and the bundle of his. Some authors actually include the tissue around it, including the pulmonary trunk right here and some of the atria, because these can generate ectopic beats, especially this pulmonary trunk here. But most of the modern authors, for board purposes, the junctional region is the AV node and the bundle of his. Another thing, what is the fiber skeleton? I think I covered this before, but some of you YouTube viewers didn't get that lecture. So this is a very complicated piece of anatomy. Everything in silver gray here, that's the fiber skeleton. It connects. Now, now in this fiber skeleton, we have the atria cut off. So here's the plane that we're looking at. So if you saw in the inter, or the, if you saw through the coronary sulcus, right, that contains the circumflex circumflex artery and the right coronary artery. That's where that groove that it travels in. If you cut, take a little knife and you saw into that and pull all this off, this is the view that you see right here. And you can actually see this is the view. My students will know this is called the base, the anatomical base of the heart. And beneath it, so this is ventricular myocardium coming in. All this ventricular myocardium attaches to the undersurface, which we can't see, but it attaches to this silver thing. And that's called the fibrous skeleton. And then if we put the atria back on, the atria would attach to it. So who cares about that? Well, this is the electrical insulation that prevents the wave of depolarization from jumping right from the atria into the ventricles. There's only one spot normally where the current from the atria can pass into the ventricles and that is right here. That's a hole where the penetrating fibers from the bundle of his go through and take the current uh, from the AV node. So that's important. We're going to look at some conditions in this class. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome uh, is the big one that we'll look at where people have not one but they have two, three, four, maybe five of them and those people who have a condition called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome where the atrial spark can actually short circuit and jump into the atria without even going through the AV node. And they can get AVRT, atrial ventricular reentry tachycardia, which I think is the second most common cause of SUV. Yeah, that is supraventricular tachycardia. We'll get to that in our course. We'll talk about the main types of supraventricular tachycardia is AVRT, AVNRT uh, are the big ones. Uh, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, those are all supraventricular tachycardia. So we'll talk about those. All right. So that's the that's the whole. It's in a region of the fibrous skeleton called the fibrous right fibrous trigone, which is part of the fiber central body. You guys can go look back at the slides to see what those regions are, but uh, that's the fiber skeleton, so super, super important. Two functions of it, again, were uh, to protect the current from the atria from jumping in to the ventricles, and vice versa, because once the current leaves the atria and goes through the ventricles, if you have other holes in here, you don't want the current jumping back into the atria. So it insulates the atria from the ventricles. Super important. It also provides a platform. These are the annuli of the fibrous skeleton. Uh, the valves, the cusps or leaves of the valves anchor into the underside of this fibrous skeleton. And this thing is perfectly flat and therefore it gives them a nice even surface to anchor to. So when they close, they close correctly and without gaps. When people get old, sometimes this warps and degenerates and it pulls the valves apart so the valves leak. So fiber skeleton is actually really, really important. Uh, what else did I want to say? Uh, these are called annulus too. Uh, so this is the the mitral annulus of the fiber skeleton. This is the tricuspid annulus of the fiber skeleton. And this would be the aortic annulus. And out here, can't see this one, but it goes underneath here and around. That's the pul pulmonary annulus of the fibrous skeleton. All right. <clears throat> oh, I did label them. Here we go. There's all the parts I just labeled. Fibrous skeleton. Here's kind of a, a, hor a coronal view, which is nice to see. So here's the fibrous skeleton drawn out, kind of just a cartoon, right? It's not 
anatomically correct, but it, it drives the point home that this fiber skeleton, no current can get through this thing. These are the valves. The current can't jump through the these hollow valves, right? Um, but it goes right through here. The this penetrating portion of the bundle hiss is the only place that the current can get from the atria into the ventricles normally. Why is the atria needed to contract first? <clears throat> well, we need to fill the ventricles all the way up. Remember, ventricular diastole, blood passively drains into the right and left ventricle, but it doesn't fill all the way up. We need to squeeze the last bit of blood in there, kind of pack it in there. And therefore, we have an atrial systole that occurs, and the atria contract. Remember, you guys, what I just taught this in lab. What is the heart sound associated with atrial systole? That in people your age is usually no big deal. That's an S3 heart sound. Atrial systole causes the S3 heart sound. Uh, so that fill, that jams the rest of the blood into the ventricles, and then ventricular systole occurs, and a, a full load of blood is delivered into the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunks. So everybody's happy. If there was no delay, so, so uh, the point of that being <clears throat> we can't let the current jump right into the ventricles because then they would contract almost the same time the atria contract. We have to delay that current to give atrial systole a chance to contract. Remember, what does that current do, this wave depolarization? It causes the, a, a contraction of the atria. That's the whole point of it. The current goes through first, and the, there's a delayed reaction where the atria contract and squeeze blood into the ventricles. So we need to slow that current down. That's what the AV node does, right? It's the COP, and we'll look at slides of that. If that didn't occur, the atria and the ventricles would contract about at the same time, and you wouldn't be able to fill up the ventricles, so your ejection fraction, or the amount of blood that you shoot out of the heart would be lower than normal and you wouldn't feel good. You might have hypotension, hypovolemia, and not feel tired and maybe get cyanotic and a whole bunch of stuff happens because of that. So that delay is super important. All right, now let's talk about the myocardia itself, the, the muscle of the heart. We had a picture of it somewhere. This is all myocardium. This is ventricular myocardium kind of we're looking at and there's the pericardium over the top of that and um, endocardium underneath that but the meat of the heart the smooth muscle the cardiac muscle that does the contraction uh, we need to talk about that because that's that's important right the heart the reason we can eject blood from our heart is because of these myocardial cells and 99 percent of all the heart cells they are I like to call them the worker bees why is the worker bee so tired Unlike a real bee, he never sleeps, right? Billions of heartbeats in a lifetime. The poor worker bee never gets to sleep. I mean, none of the, the, the cells in the heart get to sleep. They just have to take a short nap during diastole. So I'm so tired, I never get to rest. So the worker bees, they are the ones that are physically contracting. And when they all contract together, you squish the chambers and shoot blood like squeezing a toothpaste tube, you shoot blood out of the heart like that. So their contractions what drive the blood through and out of the heart. The worker bees are really important. But they have a secret. They're, they're worker bees and they contract, but they're also autorhythmic. That's their secret. Uh, what does that mean, autorhythmic? That means the, the S, who's the champion autorhythmic cell? the fastest depolarizer. That's the SA node. He depolarizes super, he or she, depolarizes very quickly, and it's like dropping the stone. It drops the stone first in the river and send, or in the lake and sends out that wave of depolarization. The worker bees, they're autorhythmic too. Even though they're really muscular, they have a countdown as well. They're counting down. Um, their dream is to someday run the heart for a couple beats at least uh, but they they don't because the SA node is too fast but they are autorhythmic if you scrape one of these guys out if you grab him and throw him in a petri dish uh, he will contract all by himself because he's autorhythmic he can generate his own action potential 
Uh, so they're autorhythmic. The trouble is they're slow like a turtle. So very rarely do they get to spark the action potential uh, or pace the heart. That's called pace. They don't get to run the heart because they're so darn slow. Uh, but every now and then they do. Have you heard of uh, premature ventricular contractions or premature atrial contractions or complexes, if you will? Uh, these are examples uh, of, of worker bees getting crazy and depolarizing the heart first. Or they beat the SA node to the punch. So every now and then, and people, those are called palpitations when those worker bees depolarize and they beat the SA node. And we'll talk extensively about uh, the, the PACs and the PVCs and PJCs and uh, all the atrial ventricular eat, uh, ectopic atrial tachycardia is another example of a gang of workers uh, and atrial fibrillation these are all worker bees that have went crazy they're rebels they've turned into rebels and they're running the heart so that's the theory behind there so therefore worker bees or run-of-the-mill myocardial cells are autorhythmic they can spark the heart if you know if they get fast or if something uh, if you have too much potassium floating around your blood, that makes the heart cranky. It increases their chances, hyperkalemia. Uh, but there's a problem, and we said their problem is they're so slow. The SA node, the AV node, the bundle of Hiss are way faster. Uh, and they will. The, those are the three big ones that usually pace the heart. But every now and then, you get a kind of a wild hair, a rebel, and it can run the heart for a while. So everything we said here already, normally they're very slow. They don't pace the heart. Sometimes they can become mischievous, a little mischievous man here. Uh, and they can run the heart. And those that's, again, that's what premature atrial complexes or premature atrial contractions, whatever you want to call it. Premature ventricular contraction, super, super normal, probably 80 to 90%. Some studies show uh, even close to 100% of people over 40 have these every day. Most people don't recognize them. Some people freak out. Uh, that's kind of unfortunate. Uh, well, don't, I won't we'll wait till we come to there. I'll talk to that talk to uh, that end more when we get there. So, if they do run the heart, now you got yourself an arrhythmia. That's not a sinus rhythm when these guys when the atrioventricle myocardial cells are running the heart, that's called an arrhythmia. There's the examples, eat, ectopic atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, just a bunch of them. What, what else can they do? So in addition to contracting, as we said, they can also spread the wave of depolarization. That's the third thing. So worker bees, they contract and squeeze blood out of the heart. They're also counting down, so they potentially could be used to pace the heart. But they also have ability to let the wave of depolarization spread right through to their neighbors. Uh, so that has a name. Uh, when you're using the, the worker bees to spread the wave of depolarization and not using any of the super fast conduction highways like Bachmann's bundle, like the bundle branches, that's called cell to cell spread. And that can happen through the atria and it does happen normally through the atrium ventricle. But this is slow compared to when you're going down the super highways like the bundle branches. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and that's an important concept to understand cell, cell to cell spread. It goes fast, but not nearly as fast as it's supposed to. And therefore, you can get, when we talk about bundle branch blocks, you can get some really abnormally wide QRS complexes. Uh, because of this slow cell to cell spread. Okay, everybody good with that? All right, another concept. There's O. Tyson back in the back in the day. He was a knocker outer, right? Overdrive, overdrive suspe uh, sus um, sus <laughs> I can't say the word today. Suppression, overdrive suppression, the crushing of the worker bee's dream. So sad. So. The worker bees depolarizing. He's a, about 
75% depolarized. He's excited because, oh my God, I'm going to get to run the heart. I'm going to pace the heart. And here comes the wave of depolarization from the SA note and bangs him in the head and he contracts before he depolarized. So he didn't use his own depolarization to cause his own contraction. Instead, he used the SA nodes. His timer was knocked out. That's called overdrive suppression, and that happens normally to all myocardial cells. The SA node wave of depolarization is fast enough to knock all of them out, even though they're all counting down. Everybody good with that concept? Overdrive suppression. All right, we said that already. Ensures So this ensures that only one wave of depolarization is sweeping over the heart, because we don't want two waves going. Uh, with Parkinson-White syndrome, we are going to have two waves of depolarization going, a rebel wave and a normal wave, and there's a collision, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to that. But sometimes you can have two waves, but it's not a good thing. All right, now pacemaker cells. We've talked about it, but let's officially talk about it. So although any myocardial cell has the potential to become a pacemaker, some are born to be fast, and some are born to be pacemakers. And these guys, of course, are the SA node and the AV node and the bundle of Hiss. Those guys are fast. The SA node is untouchable. It's like Usain Bolt, super, super fast. But these are the pacemaking cells. They are not the great... Well, they're the, the AV node and the bundle of Hiss. The bundle of Hiss isn't bad, but they're not the greatest. They don't contract even though there might be some muscle fiber in them, they don't really contract much. They're not the greatest at passing the electrical signal either. They're not like the bundle branches or Bachmann's bundle. Their main job is to pace the heart. The AV node, in fact, is, slows down the signal. So they're, they're born to pace the heart. Who's the fastest? This guy right here, incredible athlete, Usain Bolt. The champion of all cardiac autorhythmic cells, is the SA node or Usain Bolt of the of the cardiac cells, um, aka for SA node by the way is sinoatrial node. Uh, what's a sinus rhythm of the heart? Sinus rhythm. I didn't write it down here, but sinus rhythm means that the SA node is running the show. He's pacing the heart. The patient is said to be in sinus rhythm because the SA node is f depolarizing faster than anybody else. So normally it paces the heart. Okay, I think we know everything else there. Uh, there's a third type of cell uh, in the conduction system. Now only about 1% of all the cardiac cells are conduction fiber. And they're a special breed. They can pass the signal. The cell, remember we talked about cell to cell, the worker bees can pass the signal to its buddy and he passes it to his next buddy. It's fast, but it's not anything like these conductive cells are. They're super, super fast. So they carry that signal uh, through the atria and through the interventricular septum, through the Purkinje system. Here are the members. We got Bachmann's bundle, incredibly fast. So fast, it almost, when the SA node generates an action potential, it pops up in the left atria almost immediately super fast. We have atrial internodal pathways uh, which carry uh, the the right atria isn't quite as fast. It can't, the cell to cell spread isn't very good through the right atria so it needs some helpers and so it, we have these internodal pathways that are in the right atria. Uh, then we have the bundle branches super fast as well. Probably just as fast as, as Bachmann's bundle. Uh, and then the Purkinje fibers those are the ends that, that the, the smaller little, like normal little highways, still fast, faster than cell to cell spread, but not nearly as fast as Bachmann's bundle and the bundle branches. All right, so these guys are designed to conduct the wave very quickly. Uh, some authors include the AV node in the bundle of Hiss as members of the conduction system because they do tr they do transmit the bundle especially the bundle of the hiss is, a bundle of hiss is pretty fast the AV node is not fast though right that's then that's a good thing that actually slows down the signal and gives 
the atria chance to contract before the ventricles do. But the AV node and bundle of his, they have virtually no contractile function. They don't help, you know, contract the mate. They don't help contract the atria or the ventricles, and they. But they're still autorhythmic, so they're pretty good at that. They can pace pretty quickly. In fact, we'll see the AV node is the second string pacemaker. He runs super fast, not quite as fast as Usain Bolt as the SA node, but pretty darn fast. All right, here's the entire heart's electrical system. Great board question. Which one of the following is not a member of the heart's uh, electrical conduction system? SA node starts the spark. Bachmann's bundle takes it over to the left atria. Atrial internodal pathways make up for slow cell-to-cell -cell spread in the right atria. Then we have the AV node who slows things down. Usually has one, but sometimes two entry tracks we'll talk about, AVRT, oh sorry, AVNRT, which is the number one cause of supraventricular tachycardia. We have the atrioventricular bundle or the AV bundle. I like to call it the bundle of Hiss, but those are all AKAs for it. Right and left bundle branches, and they have some five divisions as well, especially the left one has three, three divisions. The right one has two anatomical divisions, but they act as one, so cardiologists, electrophysiologists, they don't it's just got one branch, as we'll see. And then there's a set of tiny Purkinje fibers that are the smallest, the slowest, uh, sometimes called the subendocardial plexus. All right, so here's that very first drawing we saw. There's Bachmann's bundle. There's the SA node, so the spark occurs here. The action potential s flies over to the left atria would be here, and then it spreads back really quickly through cell-to-cell -cell spread. Very slow cell-to-cell -cell spread here, uh, and therefore we need some helpers, the, inter the atrial internodal pathways. The name of the game is to get all these signals from the atria coming to the AV node about the same time. And we're not showing the two approach tracks here. I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. There's a delay here. Then the signal goes through the fiber skeleton into the bundle of Hiss, splits into the right bundle branch. Notice how this cardiology book, they didn't draw the moderator branch, which is, would be coming through here, because it's, there's no, it acts the same bundle branch blocks there. It doesn't matter where it, it doesn't calculate in. But on the left bundle branch, there's actually three. Did they not show the third? Um, they didn't show the septal branch, but there's three branches that are important here. And then the little tiny ones at the end, those are the Purkinje system. So that is the that's the conduction system. Let's talk some more about the SA node, the usual pacemaker of the heart. Super fast, as we said. It's actually really superficially placed into the heart. Little flat thing, those are the dimensions of it. It is located right underneath the epicardium, which is the same as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Sometimes it's just called the visceral pericardium. It's in the region of the heart called the sulcus terminale. Basically, it's by the junction of the superior vena cava where it meets the right atria, kind of on the top. Let's look at a picture. So here's the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. We're looking at the right side of the heart. Here is the, the right lateral wall of the right atria. That's that view that we've been using over and over in class where we take this off. It's a pectinate uh, muscle is that looks like a comb, right? The, kind of comb-like is right there. That would be, you'd see it better on the underside. So superior vena cava, right where it connects to the, right where it connects to the right atria is, that's it. That's where the SA node lives, super uh, superficial. So therefore, if you have pericarditis, you can actually start to interfere and take that, the infection can spread. We just talked about pericarditis yesterday, right? It can spread into the SA node and knock it out of action. And now you don't have a sinus rhythm anymore. Somebody else has to pace the heart. Usually it's the AV node. Uh, metastatic disease can spread there and permanently wipe out the SA node. Uh, or an atrial myocardial infarction can knock out. Uh, this is a living tissue. It has to have blood supply. If you get a superficial MI, it can take that out as well. So its countdown is also influenced by some big players. 
sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Sympathetic nerves connect directly to it. Turn those on, the tiger jumps out of the woods and you turns on your releases your sympathetic flow from the vasomotor center of the medulla and it speeds up the the depolarization so your heart speeds up. Parasympathetic slows it down. Those are both connected right into it. So here's sympathetics coming off the sympathetic chain and you see we got one going right into it. Notice the sympathetics go all over the place in the heart. So sympathetics, we got to have this heart going if the tiger jumps out of the woods. Notice the parasympathetics. Here's the vagus nerve. Connects to the SA node up here. There's the AV node, but that's it. The vagus nerve doesn't plug into the rest of the heart. So it's not uh, considered as important, I guess. Angiotensin II, we talked about that too. Remember the R2A system ultimately releases angiotensin II. It has receptor sites on the SA node and AV node. That can also speed this thing up as well. Connections. So it directly connects to the myocardial cells in the right atria that are there. So cell to cell spread is initiated. The interatrial, the internodal pathways, the atrial internodal pathways it connects to, because cell to cell spread is so slow. And those take the impulse directly to the AV node approach tracks. Then there's this Bachmann's bundle, which is incredibly fast. Here's a coronal view. Just cartoon of these. There's the internodal pathways. There is the, I guess that's the AV node, which should be really about here. Here's Bachmann's bundle. So the, the stone is dropped in the water here. And this is so, way faster than these internodal pathways. It immediately jets over here. Uh, and it's depolarizing all this as it goes. So all this is depolarized, cell to cell spread. All of these signals of the SA node reach the AV node approach tract or approach tracks at about the same time. But super important Bachmann's bundle. Get a myocardial infarction in this region. Take this out. <clears throat> Your heart doesn't feel very good. You lose a good chunk, not a huge chunk. You're not going to die from it immediately anyway. But you takes out some of the you'll lose some of your ejection fraction if you if you lose Bachmann's bundle. SA node any action potential generated by the SA node spreads immediately through the walls we just talked about this right so technically the right atrium contracts it does contract just a tiny tiny bit before the left but they're almost simultaneously. But how can the right atrium and left atrium contract nearly simultaneously? The SA node is in the right atrium. We just gave you the answer. Shouldn't that contract first? No. Bachmann's bundle saves the day. Again, super fast highway. We talked about this already. So without Bachmann's bundle, your right atria would contract way before the left, and you would lose some of your ejection fraction. Your heart wouldn't work right. Here's a cadaver heart. The SA node would be right here. There's Bachmann's bundle. It's up at the top part of the heart in this. Uh, type of a view, which is really more the superior heart, right? The heart, the heart. We talked about that in class. Sits like a pyramid, with the left atria on the back of the posterior thoracic wall. Um, but and I mean, most of the people just say this is an A to P view of the heart. There's Bachmann's bundle up here. Okay. There's the there's the um, the limbus. Remember that. Atrial septal defects, there's the limbus of the fossovalus. The valve is, where's the valve? I guess that would be the valve here. Kind of a strange view, but that's where a patent foramen ovale occurs when that doesn't fuse. We just talked about that, I think on Monday. All right, pacemakers, the rate of depolarization is typically around 70 to 80 action potentials per minute. Normally, the faster, the fastest of all autorhythmuses is, of course, the SA node. It usually depolarizes 70 to 80 beats per minute. Therefore, you could say the SA node has the highest rate of autorhythmicity out of any other tissue in the heart. We said this already, but here's some specifics. The AV node is kind of the second string fastest. Uh, he can pace the heart up to 60 beats per minute. I mean, if he takes over and the SA node fails, you might not even know it. 
40 to 60 is average. Can permanently take over the job of pacing if you have to. Next is the bundle of hiss. Much slower though, 20 to 40 beats per minute. So you're going to start noticing problems. You might get a little winded when you uh, get a little dizzy when you stand up fast. That's that's running pretty slow. And if heaven forbid, these the essay note, the AV note, and the bundle of hiss are taken out of action, the bundle branches can actually depolarize. They're kind of the fourth fastest. Uh, they run the heart at maximum 40. It's typically around 30 beats per minute, and it's pretty hard to uh, to stay alive. It's very uncomfortable, so you're going to have to get a pacemaker inserted to keep you alive from that. I should note that the the worker bees of the atrial myocardium some of them can really be rebels and they can run the heart sometimes 60 even 65 beats per minute sometimes they, you can develop a tachycardia from them that ectopic atrial tachycardia uh, so but i didn't you don't really include them as a permanent taking over of the heart like these guys do they're more of rebels and they kind of hit and miss and they come and drive you crazy and then they go away but they can. Here's the classic train analogy. I think this is from Sherwood. Good physiology book. Uh, the SA note is the engine. These other cars are just kind of coasting back here. If something breaks in the SA node, the AV node just takes over. Something breaks in the AV node, then the bundle of hiss takes over. Here's the classic, classic analogy from train analogy. So we have some backups. If you lose your essay node, it's not the end of the world. The amazing AV node. This thing is absolutely amazing. It's located deeper than the essay node. It's uh, subendocardially located between the endocardium and myocardium. Uh, so it's way down there. It's in the inferior region of the right ventricle. Specifically, it's at the tip of the triangle of Koch. And so we know exactly where it is. And we'll look at that in a minute. You could also say, electrophysiologically speaking, that's in the junctional region of the heart. Okay, but anatomically, it's located at the tri triangle of Koch at the tip of it. Remember, we talked about that in class. Let's look at the picture. So here's that same view of the heart, only we've taken the wall away. So all that pectinate muscle has been removed. And remember, pectinate muscle is only on the lateral portion of the right atria. The inside of the atria is smooth. Don't see any pectinate muscle here. Uh, but here's that same view. Uh, we can see the fossa ovalis here. There's the valve. Uh, there's the limbus of the fossa. This is not a patent foramen ovale. It looks like it's welded shut in this cadaver specimen. Inferior vena cava is here. So we have the eustachian valve which funnels blood into the foramen ovale when you're uh, still in your mommy's tummy. But that eustachian valve kind of morphs into a long mountain range which goes all the way across the atria up to the intraatrial septum. That's called the tendon of Tordaro. Uh, you can see that. In fact, I test on that in my gross anatomy class, lab class. You can see that really easily. It's good to learn this because then on the other side, inferiorly, uh, you have the coronary sinus, the opening to the coronary sinus, which has a valve called the Bijan valve. Make sure you know that stuff for boards. I, I don't think the other professors are teaching that. And they, I mean, those, those are, you got to know that stuff. The ostium of the coronary sinus, so this, the base of it here, that makes up the base of the tendon of Tordaro. Okay, the tendon of, or I'm sorry, the, the Koch's triangle, the tendon of Tadaro is here. The base is the kind of the where the open to the ostium of the coronary sinus is. Remember, that's where the coronary uh, sinus is, that big giant vein on the back of the heart. It drains all the venous blood from the heart into, into the right atrium. And then this is the cusp of one of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. So this is the ostium, the part of the fibrous skeleton. You couldn't see. If we dug through here, we could see the fibrous skeleton. That, where it drops off into the valve, or the tricuspid orifice, um, that makes up the other border of Koch's triangle. And if you follow, I mean, electrophysiologists, they'll find the eustachian valve, and they can follow this mountain range, tendon of Tordaro, right to the very the interatrial wall, and you'll be right on top of the, the AV node. That's how they get to the AV node. 
And then we also know that most people have a fast track. Uh, that That's the approach track to where all the interatrial, atrial, interatrial pathways connect to this and cell, cell spread dumps into here. Some people I think it's about, I want to say 20%. I'll see the slide in a minute. Um, have a slow tract. They have a double tract AV node. And you can get a vicious race track. Normally just the fast track works. Slow track doesn't work. But if the slow track ever does work and you get a, P, uh, a, uh, a PAC just in the right place, you have a chance to get a race track of current going quickly around this anomalous track. And that's the number one cause of supraventricular tachycardia. That's your heart racing 160 beats per minute for no reason. Uh, and that's called AVNRT, atrial nodal ventricular tachycardia. Did I get that right? Atrial, AV, atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. Whew, AVNRT. So we'll talk about that in depth because that's the most, that's very common in humans. All right, that's enough of that. Uh, approach tracks, I just said that. I was off a little bit. So most of the time, we just have this fast one. 80% of the time, that's most of us humans have that. 20% of you humans, or us, we, I, who know? Well, you, 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 know, you may never know if you have a slow track because it's not like a delta wave. There's no uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. You can tell that they have a hole in their, you can tell that they have a problem. This one you can never tell until you get that tachycardia. Uh, but 20% of people have this slow tract as well. All right, everything I talked about, there's the supraventricular, uh, yeah, atrial nodal reentry tachycardia. Atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. Okay, what is the AV node, this amazing AV node? He's the cop, traffic cop, stop. Hey, wave of depolarization, slow it down. Uh, so its job is to, once it, gets where is it here it is once it receives the action potentials its job is to slow that racing signal down uh, and that's what it does that's actually got a name that's called decremental conduction or slowing down conduction uh, so the function of the AV node uh, is for decremental conduction right so now everybody knows this all you physiology students it slows the heart that's nothing but pathology students, something super important it also does. What if you have, so you got signal coming in here 80 beats per minute, or you're working out, maybe it's, maybe it's 160 beats, maybe it's 180 beats per minute. Uh, it's letting signal go through about, that's all the faster to let the signal go through. What happens if you have atrial fibrillation? How fast does the atria contract? How many waves of depolarization are are hitting this in atrial depolarization. How about 550 beats per minute on average? Really, really fast, right? This AV node, sorry, I got the garbage truck coming outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but it's garbage day. Um, the AV node's going to say, no way. I'm not letting 500 beats go into the ventricles. It'll, it'll kill us. Uh, so that's a very decremental conduction is very important. Uh, to preventing over stimulation of the ventricles. People who don't have a good AV node are in big trouble if they get atrial fibrillation or even atrial flutter or, or any other, or eat ectopic atrial tachycardia. They're in big trouble. So, decremental conduction uh, prevents against overstimulation of the ventricles. Talked about that. The AV node has, we already said this, has sympathetic and parasympathetic fiber uh, going right into it. Par now, this is always good physiology questions, right? Parasympathetic stimulation will actually increase the delay. It'll increase decremental conduction because we always think which will slow the heart. So those are inversely related. So you can, physiology teachers can make good questions with the, with the effect of parasympathetic stimulation. Okay, so be careful with that. Sympathetic stimulation decreases the delay time, so it decreases decremental conduction, which will let the heart speed up. 
If you decrease decremental conduction, it, it, that slowdown, that cop says, okay, you can go by a little bit faster. So important concept there. And we already looked at this in another picture, but uh, just the point, again, being that the AV node and SA node both have uh, plug-ins for parasympathetic, which is the vagus nerve, and sympathetic fiber, where the rest of the heart only has plug-ins for uh, for sympathetic fiber, not parasympathetic fiber. Okay, bundle of Hiss. Now the penetrating fibers actually physically connect to the AV node. The penetrating fibers go through that hole, which surprisingly doesn't have a name, hole for the penetrating fibers. You'd think everything else has a name, but that doesn't, that I could find. Um, so that's its job. It takes the signal after it's been slowed down in the AV node, then it goes ripping through the, the bundle of Hiss and connects to the bundle branches. It is, just like the AV node, the bundle of Hiss is part of the junctional region as well. AV node, there's the penetrating fibers of the bundle of the Hiss reaching through to the AV node. Okay, and again, the bundle of Hiss, that's the only normal physiological passageway through the fiber, uh, through the fiber skeleton talked about that already has a dual blood supply it's so important so if, if one type of heart attack might take out one of the blood supply it can still stay alive because it has double blood supply it's made of special cells called Purkinje cells they're very they're very quick just like the rest of the Purkinje system has the AV bundle has two components the penetrating portion and the distal portion here's a cartoon of the fiber skeleton which really they shouldn't have drawn it like muscle because it's not muscle it's like a connective very strong type 1 collagen type thing uh, but there's the penetrating fibers connecting to the AV node here this is the old school drawing we know there's uh, well they're showing the internodal pathways but they actually connect to the approach tract so it's kinda not drawn anatomically correct Penetrating fibers take the hand off. So here's the wave of depolarization. Went through slow down, and now there's the AV node taking the hand off, the penetrating fibers, so uh, the bundle can race, or the signal can race off down through the bundle branches. Uh, accessory pathways. Fiber skeleton can have pathological holes in it. We talked about this a bit. Uh, these holes are usually filled with a super fast conduction fiber. So normally this is the only place, the only hole in the fiber skeleton. But as we said, sometimes in Wolf Parkinson White Serum, you can have other pathological holes in the fiber skeleton that are filled with really fast fibers. And therefore, waves of depolarization can sneak into the ventricles ahead of time and start a slow cell-to-cell -cell spread of depolarization. It kind of doesn't screw up the heartbeat too bad, depending on how many holes there are. It's the supraventricular tachycardia, the AVRT, that can be very, I know several students who've had this, it can be really disabling people. We'll talk about this when the time comes, but fiber skeleton would be through here. There's normal, uh, there's the bundle of Hiss, where the AV node and the bundle of Hiss connect. That's normal. The signal goes down the bundle branches and it spreads out in the Purkinje system. But here we have a hole that are filled with special fast fibers are called Kemp fibers. It's a patient with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So one of the intraatrial inter nodal pathways comes right by here and the signal goes, oh look, let's go this way. There's no insulation here. So while the rest of the current is going through, uh, going into the AV node over here, this one's sneaking ahead. This is the rebel current. And it's like, yeah, we found new territory in it. This part of the atri the ventricle is depolarizing. It's trying to inject blood, and there's no blood to eject. You can see this as a delta wave on EKG when we talk about it. And then, then the finally, the decremental conduction passes, and the signal goes racing down the bundle branches through the Purkinje system super fast, and it hits the rebel current head on, and the two currents cancel each other out. So that's a normal heartbeat with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. You can see this part of the depolarization as a delta wave. Trouble is, if so, if you get if something snuffs out the rebel current, like a like a PVC happens right here, 
let's say a PVC happens here and snuffs out the rebel current, now the regular current comes flying around and there's nobody to collide with. And it says, hey, look, there's someplace cool. Let's go check it out. And the fast current from the ventricles now gets up here in the atria. And it's, you might as well have an SA node right here because the rebel current has, or this regular current from the ventric ventricles sparks a new spark here. Goes up and knocks out the SA node. And this is now the new, uh, the new uh, SA node type thing. This paces the heart. And it goes, oh, look. Let's go back down here. And so you get a racetrack around here. And that's the problem with Wolf Parkinson White patients is they get this racetrack of current, which runs 160, 180 beats per minute, depending. And uh, it can be dangerous. As, as long as it's running the correct direction down the AV node, that slowdown portion will work. This is called AVRT, by the way. I think it's second most common cause of supraventricular tachycardia can be deadly if the current runs backwards this way you can get the current running backwards uh, because the the decremental conduction doesn't work if you're running backwards through the AV node and you can get a heart rate a ventricular heart rate over 200 beats per minute sometimes 250 beats per minute you can die from this one it's fairly rare but we'll talk about that when the time comes all right, so the distal portion of the bundle of his just carries the signals on to the right and left bundle branches called the, sometimes they're called the Tawara branches after the guy who discovered them, the doctor who discovered them. So there's the right and left branches there. Um, they just run in the, inter, the muscular interventricular septum. There's a right and left branch. The right bundle is a single thick cord buried deeply in the interventricular septum. Of course, it's more to the right of the muscular interventricular septum. It behaves as a single branch, even though anatomically, see there's this massive moderator branch, right, anatomically, but it behaves as one branch. So you can't, if you have a conduction block here, it just behaves like a right bundle branch block. You can't, you can't tell the difference between a, a block here and a block here. So therefore, this is how EKG books draw it. They just draw it as a single branch. Not true with the left one, though. The left has three flat-out branches. Uh, left bundle branch branches into a septal branch, anterior fascicle, and posterior fascicle. And bundle branch blocks on any one of these presents. Here comes the garbage truck again. Uh, it presents differently, and you can tell where the bundle branch block is so therefore they draw all three of them in there right left bundle we just said that sometimes there's only two this can be anomalous sometimes it's like a caught equina though sometimes they just it has like a horse's tail there take a look at it here now we talked about this there's an anterior fascicle that runs toward the anterior papillary muscle of left ventricle posterior fascicle runs toward the posterior papillary, and then there's a septal fascicle. This one's important, this little one. Um, the Q wave on the QRS complex on ECG or EKG, that is all about the septal branches. So you got to have that one. And we'll look at that in, in heart attacks. You can it, it, A gigantic Q wave is a sign of a myocardial infarction. We'll look at that next week probably. Uh, but here's a horse's tail type. Of right bundle branch and you just have to guess you know if you're an electrophysiologist trying to zap some of these things for whatever reason you got to just do the best you can if it's in this horsetail configuration there's the anterior fascicle posterior fascicle those are the septal fascicles there all right so now with with all your anatomy and physiology skills back up to speed i think you'll be able to understand when we start talking about these arrhythmias especially the premature complexes that we'll talk about. All right, we'll see you in the next video.